So hi everyone, I'm here with Pedro Mayer today. So Pedro and I go way back actually, we used to work together at Amex, but Pedro, you're based in Canada. You've got huge amounts of experience at a senior level working in the banking industry with some of the big banks, yeah, also in the telco industry, both in credit risk and in collections as well. So Pedro, thanks very much for joining me today. And I think we're gonna talk a bit about Canada and what some of the things you've been seeing. Uh, thank you, Chris. Hello everyone. And yes, we go a long way back when you were here in Canada and Although many things have changed over the last several years, a lot of things have not. So, so how's, how have things changed over the last sort of six months or so? We had the pandemic, and which hit everyone in the world pretty hard. I think in Canada, it sounded like the lockdown was pretty strict, right? It's been pretty strict and pretty strict for a while. So as we've come out of that period, as we come out of the period of like restrictions, what's been the, what's been the impact on the consumer in terms of like, and the economy, really? It has been really important. Of course, we went through a period where there was a lot of government support to ensure that people and businesses that were not able to work were mm. able to get some support to keep things going. But those uh, government grants ended, and now people need to pay them. And the, best, the first payment of those were in the tax year for uh, 2022. So starting April, you have now consumers and businesses paying loans, seeing that the economy is soft. You see the uh, across the world, but in Canada, a significant rate of inflation, mm. uh, which we were not used to. The interest rates uh, have been hiking over the last several months. So all that has been adding pressure to both consumer and small businesses. And that is uh, impacting the creation of jobs and making people who were used to save over the last couple of years right now use that disposable income to, to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But it's but every, it seems that everything is collecting at the same time. So you've got interest payments from government loans or government support has happened this year. And then we've got increasing energy costs, which I think affects Canada, maybe a little bit less than it's affected in Europe, but it's still there because it's a global market. And now we've got in, in, increasing interest rates. So it feels like it's almost like a perfect storm to a certain extent. And it's that's this year, is it, that really things are starting to crystallize? Yes. And I would say it's the tip of the iceberg. Even I will say it's a little bit of calm before the storm. Because mm. people know it. You can see it, the, what is happening in the economy. You can feel it. But you, there's still people uh, wanting to go back to their day-to-day -day and spend. And you can see across a small, medium, and large corporations starting to see some signs of delinquency mm. coming up. But when they see, especially the big corporations, the big banks, the risk in their portfolio, they see this massive overall growing. Mm. That's why you will see in many of the Canadian banks adding additional provision to their portfolios in, 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 short, in order to ensure that they would be ready when those loans will default. A lot of Canadians, they have uh, home properties and they mm. have this in, uh, very important home equity. And I mm. think people have start, start to tap into those home equities using their credit cards, try to keep up with the day-to-day -day and spend. But as we all know, that cannot last forever. People are starting mm. to have a more important and bigger minimum due payments across their credit cards and their lines of credit. Mm. And at some point, they will not be able to catch up with their monthly payments. And what's your sense as you, you obviously continue to chat with folks across the industry there? What's your sense around when you think delinquencies are going to start flowing through? It sounds like some of it, you're starting to see some of it, but it's not huge amounts. But when do you think that's going to start flowing through? Well, it's interesting, and every industry within in Canada is different. Every company will have different levels based on the risk management policies mm -hmm. and controls they have put in place. But based on what I have talked to different people, they expect that the delinquency will rise towards the end of the year. And at some point, everyone expects that there will be this seasonality of delinquency plus the snowball that has been created in mm -hmm. Q1 of next year. So this yeah. is the time for people to get ready. Yeah, and, in and in terms of readiness to that point, you're going to see it in terms of like call volume coming through or SMS volumes coming through. So there's that volume aspect. We've got inflation, which might be a cost aspect to it. But what are some of the things that, that people are doing to get ready for it? What should they be doing to get ready for it? And it's, it's not a rocket science, but has its complexity and is moving for more self-serve digital channels. Mm -hmm. You can see across different players, small or big, that there has been a level of investment in digital, in sending SMS, emails, in making improvements to the IVRs, to be able to help consumers, to help themselves serve, to make payments, to do basic transactions uh, mm. at their own time. But I think that has not been enough. Implementing digital strategies is the right way to go, is the present and will be the future. 
but takes time, is complex, and sometimes the returns are not seen right away. And that is making some of the companies that are also feeling the stress in how much money they can spend in technology to maybe slow down and not at the pace that they should be to be ready mm. for the significant volumes that everybody is expecting. Yeah. Digital has been obviously quite evolved, I would say, over here in Europe. What's the state of evolution? Does it change by industry sector as well? So in terms of, I know you're in, in telco, for example, is that different from what you saw in the bank versus what you see elsewhere as you're, as you're talking with other industries as well in collections? Yes. Aside from the technology investment that you need, you can see that telcos have a big advantage. They have the cell phone number of their co customer. And that's, the, and that's the key element to be able to send SMS. And they have a better mm -hmm. email base, I think, relatively speaking, versus financial institutions, which maybe have that consumer a long time ago when maybe emails were not even something mm -hmm. that were captured. So having that ability to have the right contact with the customer is the same. I think that there's a bigger investment in more transactions going through SMS and email versus telephony. But I think telephony is still a very important channel to communicate with customers in collections. The problem with that is that consumers are not picking up the phone. They have call ID, they know who's calling, they can decide to pick up the phone or not. That's level of not wanting to deal with things at that point. And customers are feeling more comfortable doing that at their own time, at their own pace, when maybe there's not people around them. And I think that in the way that the companies, telco financial institutions, continue to make investments in understanding something is not only for those low risk customers that you should be using a digital SMS and email. It's really for everybody. It's a channel where you can connect with customers and engage with them. And I think that's a key element, engaging with customers so they will come back to you and tell you, I can pay or guess what? I need help to make a payment. Yeah. So I know you're a real advocate of it because you, you've seen it work and you've seen it work in the local market as well. But if you almost got that blank slate where you don't have digital strategies or either you need to make improvements in digital strategies. Where's your recommendation in terms of like where best to start in terms of looking at it in terms of implementation? I will say that if you have the capability of sending SMS and emails, I will say nothing like test and learn. Pick up really all of your customer segments, low, medium, high risk segments as an example, and test them. Send them that early notch. And I think the earlier that you do it in the cycle of delinquency, the higher the chance that customer will engage with you and come back. I have seen even SMS when we're asking to have customers call you back. It's just really a notch that says, yes, guess what? I forgot to pay. Let me pay. And there's no further interaction needed. Sometimes that customer will require an interaction and maybe call you back or interact through the SMS or email to pay. Mm -hmm. But I think the key element is do across all the risk segments and test. And from that testing, you will learn a lot of things that the customer mm -hmm. wants to do in order to engage. What do you think is holding back adoption of digital? What, I mean, I know when we were chatting, we, I was over there, we were chatting to some folks around it. It did feel like there's a little bit of a sort of resistance around whether to do that versus traditional channels. And there's a little bit of, if it isn't broken, don't try and fix it to a certain extent. But what do you think, what's the hesitation that people have got and how do you get around that? And what, what are the benefits that you've seen from it? Is it, is it a valid hesitation that, that people have got? It's a great question, Chris. I think there's, I can divide that in three. One is, of course, the technology investment. It's not that simple and that cheap to implement a good mm. digital strategy. So that requires investment and time. That's number one. But let's say that people understand the business case and they're willing to invest. And companies are doing that probably in baby steps, some of them, but they're doing that. The other one is really their perception or their legal framework in terms of mm. privacy and how you can contact customers. And I think one is the biggest roadblocks that companies are facing, especially the big corporations. Yeah. I think that dialogue between the legal teams and the business and the shops that are doing collections, that communication needs to get better to really understand not why we should not do it, but what are the things that are required from a legal perspective in the text, in the communication, in the constraints, in order to engage with more customers to pay. And the third one, which I think is the one that people have under control is their, uh, the risk of what will happen. As you said, I think you said, if it's not broken, why I need to change it? And people are saying, I call customers and by calling, they pay. Mm. Why I want to change that? Uh, an SMS and email is less intrusive. So there's this perception, and I want to use the word perception, that because it's not such an aggressive channel, that some customers will not respond. 
in my experience, I have seen that even high-risk customers respond better to an email and SMS as long as it's early on, has a call to action, and offers solutions to help that consumer that may need help to make their payment. So I think if you can remove some of those barriers, both in additional investment, dialogue with uh, legal teams, and be able to feel confident that by testing, you will see good results across your segments. I think that will make companies more comfortable that digital is the right way to go. Do you think sometimes we get caught into this whole, it's either digital or it's manual and it's, it's one or the other. So we're going to be completely committed to it. That's a different question from let's try and do that almost like in a low key way first and doing both to a certain extent and having a blended approach because the cost of digital is it's so much less, particularly if it's self-serve or the investment aside, the cost is so much less. You can almost do both. The cost of the emails is cents, isn't it? Versus, versus, versus dollars or tens of dollars for calls. Are we in that sort of almost like binary kind of world? And really we should be thinking about that. It sounds like, how do you have almost like a blended strategy, but it includes digital because it's cheap enough to almost like do across the base. I think you hit the nail on the head, Chris. I think companies are starting to realize that needs to be an omni-channel strategy. You can send an email, send an SMS and, and, and do a call. Maybe not at the same time in, in, in one day, but through the life cycle of that strategy, let's say mm. the first month of delinquency, you need to know when to send each right so that you can schedule a, an SMS and an email and maybe a call five days after in case that customer has not reached back to mm. you. Or maybe you can send a call and say, it will also be sending you an SMS and email to give you additional information. I mm. think by using an omni-channel approach, the customer can identify in which of those channels they feel more comfortable to engage with you and resolve their delinquency problem. I think mm. more and more I'm seeing that they're starting to, to have those strategies being implemented, but I think it's still a long way to go. And what about customer treatment? I know we chatted quite a bit about what's happened over here in Europe and particularly the UK, which has been regulatory driven, I, I would say, to a certain extent in terms of customer treatment or customer support in collections, which is, I think is a bit of a different kind of approach than at least I knew 10, 10 15 years ago over there. What's, your, what's been your reaction to that from a collections point of view or even what some of your concerns around that in terms of applicability in the, and really in the North American market, not just Canada, but also, you know, North America, like US or Mexico as well? I think that COVID, uh, a, a terrible thing that happened to the humanity, but in, in our space, one silver lining was the development of loss mitigation tool and payment plans to help customers that will mm. need that help. I saw across the board in many industries that from the top of the house, there was that appetite to create plans to help customers pay over time, to give them a breather, understanding that they were not able to work. And mm -hmm. COVID ended, but now we're seeing many customers uh, not being able to work all of the hours, being laid off, and they will need that same kind of help. And I think those plans have de been developed, the payment, affordable payment plans to help customers. I think the secret sauce still is in how to engage with that customer to be aware that plan exists. If mm -hmm. the customer doesn't know what the plan is, how it will help that, them pay their account over a period of time, to regain their telecom service, to keep their credit card open or any kind of service open and available. If they are not aware of that, then that customer will not take the plan. And I think that's still the problem to be solved. How to let those customers know that there's a plan for them to repay their account in really an affordable way. So that's the engagement piece, really, isn't it? It's like exactly. how do you engage people? How do you get their attention to then be able to have that 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 kind of conversation? I suppose it's just interesting looking at the treatment piece in terms of do we need to make look at different plans or different ways of actioning, particularly if talk about it being Q1, if we go into a sort of an extended downturn or if the downturn, particularly if it gets worse, are we going to need new tools in our lockers? to really offer customers in terms of particularly from a brand protection point of view or from, from a financial protection point of view as well. And what are your thoughts on that? I think those plans having developed, some of them will need fine tune to ensure mm. that they're easy to communicate because at the end of the day, the customer needs to understand that and who's going to communicate that a person over the phone, an email or an SMS, they need to explain the conditions of the plans. I think that needs to continue to evolve and mature. Because once the customer enroll, it will take some time to repay their account. And that mm. requires engagement and communication to ensure that that customer, let's say, will pay over a period of six months their loan. 
uh, that will require a different level of engagement to ensure that keeps up. I think a, a key element for that is that customers see that there is a path not only to pay their account, but what's in it for them, what they will get from paying that a loan, that service over a period of time. They will be able to improve their credit bureau. They will be able to get back the same level of perks that they had before they went into delinquency. Mm. I think they need to see that there's a win situation for them. If not, I think there will be hesitation for consumers to take the plans. And I think something that we talk about when you were here back in the spring, I think that uh, engaging early on, even before delinquency, before the problem happens or barely early on, that will be the key for company success. Customers will be struggling across different uh, bills that they need to pay. The person who gets there first and offers the right solution, explain that correctly, may be in a better position to get that customer's attention, engagement, and loyalty to pay their account and stay with them for a longer period of time. Yeah, I mean, it feels like there's a window there to do that. It sounds like the window's extended maybe a little bit. So it sounds like it's in Q1 now, but there's still, it moves really fast. It was, it just, time seems to just fly by at the moment, especially over the summer. We'll be into the summer, we'll be into September, sort of October timeframe. And then really these things have got to be in place, haven't they? It's, it's That's when things start, to, things start to flow through. I know you've got a lot of large people leadership experience, Pedro. What's your view around people leadership, particularly in times when times are tough? We've been, we've been remote versus, in the office and we've got digitalization going on in the background which can raise a lot of fears there's cost pressures going on what's your view around sort of like how to how to handle that on the floor how to handle the like the large group management really to make sure that you're getting the best from the people as well because that's also a tough situation and we can't hesitate to say to mention the fact that employees have been through a tough time too it has definitely been a game changer I think that the way that we used to engage our employees in the past has changed dramatically over the last two or three years. I think it's more difficult today to engage an employee to be at the office, mm-hmm. to be loyal to a company when you work remotely. So that combination, I think that all companies are still exploring what is the right model, bring mm-hmm. everybody back five days a week, 100% remote, something in the middle. I see from the industries here in Canada, that will be that probably bringing people for a period of time to the office, two, three, four times a week. Every company needs to identify what is best for them. But I think by bringing people in, the key element is to engage them, to train them so they can feel the brand and the company that they represent. Because I think that's the key element. When you go back and talk to customers, you need to know your services and products so that the company wants to do right for the customer. And if there's not that level of, I'm the representative of the company to help you miss or Mr. Customer. It's very difficult to engage properly. You mm-hmm. can have, the, we're talking about loss mitigation plans. If you're not well trained to offer that plan, if you don't believe that plan will help you cure your account. It's very difficult to convince that customer to take it. So mm-hmm. it's still a people business. Employees will need to be very engaged, very well trained, and understand that they're really helping customers in moments of truth. Collections is a moment of truth. If you do it right, that customer will not only pay that account, most likely will be a customer for life and most likely will talk to other people about their experience. And that creates brand loyalty in a kind of marketing that all companies are looking for. And I suppose particularly if you do use digital automation, it takes some of the easier calls out of the cycle. So average handle time goes up, the knowledge and compl- of complex products and the complexity on the calls also goes up as well. So all of that probably has to be managed in terms of making sure that those people are getting the right training or they they are understanding what the products the product set is. Definitely is changing. All those easy calls are probably now moving to digital channels, as you said. So the level of training required to manage more complex calls is evolving. But I think that's a great problem to have because now you need employees that have the experience, that they have the knowledge to be able to work with more complex transactions. And those complex transactions are more rewarding when you can help a customer going through a big problem in their personal life. They lost their job, they lost a family member, they don't know what to do. And if you can be there to help them, it's a great moment of uh, knowing that the job that you do is meaningful. But as you said, it requires more training, takes more time on the call. And I think that's something that both 
the employees and the employers, we need to realize calls are more complex and take longer time. So the investment in training, the number of people that you require to work those accounts would be different. It's something that I think we have talked to that in the past. I think the UK has seen that significant change already. I think that in the Canadian market, you're starting to see those. People are mm -hmm. learning sometimes the hard way that a moving volume to digital does not eliminate call volume. It just changes the amount of calls that you get for the length is something that people are appreciating and understanding that the dynamics are changing and takes more time, but this is the right thing to do to help customers that are struggling mm, the, mo the most. Yeah. And in terms of, and, so do we, and do you think we need a different measurement system in terms of some of the KPIs we would look at in terms of like how you manage the, how you manage the floor, how you manage the operation, how we think about, for example, stick rates, those kind of things. Is our, are our KPIs set up right for the environment we are in today, particularly if you look at the the ongoing ongoing economic situation as well, do we need different KPIs, particularly if it, we see a downturn? Uh, I think that there are some fundamentals that will need to stay there, but mm. I think that yes, they need to evolve. And in my experience, what I have seen the most difficult to be able to align and create that KPI and measure it correctly, and be able to align the work that we're asking our employees to do versus how they're rewarded is those loss mitigation plans. If you work with a customer and as an example, work a six month payment plan. I know it's the right thing to do to the customer, but what is easier for me to do as a, an agent on the phone? Ask for an immediate payment. My call will be faster. I'd get a payment. Most of the mm -hmm. times I get incent by mm -hmm. getting a payment and I get rewarded. Mm -hmm. Doing the right thing and then work with that customer over a longer period of time, getting those payments over six months, those incentives are not aligned. So you need to mm -hmm. align those payment plans, those cure rates to the employee's incentive plan and performance. Once mm -hmm. you can align those, I think that the right conversations will happen. What I have seen is difficult is how you can properly track those payment plans over a period of time. Do I need to wait six months to get my incentive being paid or I mm -hmm. get it up front? But what happens if the payment plan is not fulfilled? So I think that there's still work to do to align incentives with mm -hmm. the performance of our employees to work with customers based on what the customer needs, not necessarily what the employee wants. Yeah. The danger of the incentives, I absolutely agree, is you get these suboptimal systems, can't you, where it's like you're incenting the wrong behavior as much as you're trying to incent the right behavior. And that wrong or right behavior is the critical thing, isn't it? So if you don't get that, then you can get all sorts of things you don't want happening. Yeah. Um, early detection. I mean, there's a lot of discussion around chat GTP as an example, or large language models or AI that's been taking over, seems to have taken over my life for the last three months, <laughs> the last three months. But it did strike me in North America, like that was further ahead and adoption was further ahead. And I'm quite interested in the hands of what you've heard from a business point of view. Certainly the kids seem to be using it all the time. Uh, uh, I mean, but what's happening from a business point of view? And is that generating the same kind of excitement that, that we've seen over here in the UK? The thought is there. I think uh, companies, key decision makers know that is the future. Mm. I think that the appetite to invest that as a priority is not there yet. Mm. I think what I have heard from different places is let's try to leverage the technology that we have. That's still something that consumers will not necessarily will be able to engage and respond in the same way than mm. with regular typical channels. Let's call it a, a talking to a person. So I think that they're still at a very infant stage. Uh, I have seen very in different players offering that uh, artificial intelligence and natural language to, to be able to help improve the results. The business case is there, but I think that the payback is not as fast as many of the uh, companies would like to see. So I think that it's going to take some time. You will mm -hmm. need one or two key players to embrace that technology, see it, seeing it work. And then I think people will follow, but I have not seen the leader in the industry that will say, I will take that uh, step and move forward ahead of the rest yeah. and take advantage of it. I think the company or the companies that will take that leap of faith early on, I think they will see great results, but I think still a long way to go.
Yeah, so there's a little bit of risk aversion there. And then it's also, where does it fit within my investment pipeline? And some of the earlier stuff that's easier to do goes first to a certain extent. So that's holding it back a bit. It doesn't seem to be holding back teenagers for using it for homework, but uh, but it, <laughs> but maybe that's a, that's a different question. They have a different investment time frame. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. They're less risk averse. <laughs> Probably <laughs> that's, that, that's true. So if there were five things that you recommend taking a step back, that people look at in the collections industry, particularly in, in Canada, but in, in North America, what would you say the five things that you think are really worth looking at, top priorities? A great question. And I think it's a, a good rep- recap of what we have been talking. I think the first one that comes to mind is early delinquency strategies, pre-delinquency mm. strategies. That's a, a game changer and really a way to really tackle the problem when it starts. The second one, a smart investment in digital strategies across all of your risk segments in order to improve cure rates, but also to optimize cost across the companies, which is a big problem that companies mm-hmm. have. Third is engage employees the, the, the right way and train them properly to help customers mm-hmm. when they need it the most. Fourth, continue to improve and enhance payment plans, loss mitigation tools, to help customers when they are going through difficult times. I mm-hmm. think that will be a, a key element to help customers down the road. And I think the last one, but I think one, the one that is most important is continue to invest in collections. Mm-hmm. I think the biggest mistake I have seen in my career is companies invest in collections once they have the problem. And once you have the problem, it's very difficult to come out of it. You make continuous investments in collections in technology, in process, in people, you're ready when things are good, but you will be ready when things start to deteriorate. And again, if you do that timely, you can save hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to your company's p Yeah. But I think that I very much agree on the last point, which is it might look like arrears aren't necessarily spiking, particularly at the moment, there, although they're going up slightly, but now's the time to invest because in six months' time, if they do spike, then it's, it's too late and you're on, you've are you got a six-month exactly. time frame for it to flow uh, through. So I, I know we, we both know that, but that's obviously often critical, isn't it? Pedro, thanks very much. I, yeah, and I know we, we did a write-up of when we were chatting back in the spring, so we'll put that, that down in the links as well. But it's, it's great to talk to you as, as ever. I know you're chatting with everyone over there, so I think it's, it's great to give a bit of an update as to where we are from a Canadian point of view, at least. Anyway, so I really appreciate it. It. it was my pleasure, Chris. Always good talking to you and looking forward to talk to you again.